Romans chapter 13, if you have a Bible, grab those. If you need a Bible, there's some on the chairs there around you. If you're using those Bibles from the chairs, page 743 is where we're going to go. And uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 8 is where we're going to be starting. So we're wrapping up a section. Um, I try to do that just in case you've been tracking with us in Romans. I try to tell you when, when are we wrapping up a section where Paul's going to shift his thought. And so we're, we're wrapping up a section this morning where Paul's going to shift his, his thought starting next week. But the section started with chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. And, and so everything that Paul has said up to this point, um, even though it may seem to us like it's unrelated, it actually has threads tying it all together. And so we're going to wrap this up this morning. The question we're going to be asking this morning is, is what should characterize a Christian or, or a believer in Jesus? What is it that should mark them? What is it that when you look at someone, when you know someone, when you spend time with someone, you say, that's the kind of thing, the kind of behavior, the kind of conduct that char- should characterize a Christian? Or you've got someone on the flip side who says, hey, I'm a believer in Christ, I'm a Christian, but then you're, you're getting to know them and you're going, I don't see the kinds of things that should characterize a Christian. That's what we're looking at this morning. And so I'm going to do this in a little bit different way than I normally do. Um, I'm going to start with this statement, what should characterize the Christian is, and we're going to look at two different things that Paul says uh, this morning, in a, in a br- broadly speaking, what should characterize the Christian is. Now, before I go any further in this, I need to throw out this disclaimer. I do it from time to time. I feel like I need to today because we're going to be talking about some things where Paul's just going to lay out different types of sins, and so we're going to talk about it. I don't read your mail. I don't scan your emails, like if if you're sending them to someone other than me, right? I don't um, follow most of you on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Snapchat, If I'm friends with you on those platforms, most of you I've unfollowed, not because I don't like you, but because I choose not to know your business that you put on Facebook because I don't want to be responsible for it, right? And then so that when I get up here and and I have a sermon like today, you have no grounds by which you can say, you're talking to me. Because I don't see what most of you post. If, If I interact with your post, you know I see what you post. But that's not most of you in this room. Right? So I'm not, I'm not getting up here this morning and, and singling anyone out. The other thing is, though, when I get up here, that's usually not my goal. Right? My goal is not to use this platform, which is a great responsibility and privilege, but it comes with a weight. My goal is never to say, you know what, I'm going to use this to single this person out and just not call their name. Now, I'm not perfect, right? but I, I stay aware of that kind of thing. So I want you to know this morning, I'm not getting up here trying to single anyone out. So if I say something, you're going, he knows my business. I probably don't know your business, right? But at the same time, I'm a pastor. I'm involved in many of you guys' lives. I interact with you throughout the week, and I can't detach myself from that. But what you need to know is I'm not getting up here and indirectly trying to communicate to any one of you in this room, hoping that you get the message that this is for you, okay? And the message this morning kind of tends to, to lean that kind of way, and so I don't want you to, to think that, okay? If, if you think that, just let, let me know you think I singled you out. I used to have someone almost on a weekly basis would come up to me, and, and they would say, did someone talk to you this week? Did some? <laughs> nope. And so just, just let me throw that out there. So what should characterize the Christian is? And the first thing that Paul's going to say is not lawlessness, but love. Now, before we jump in, I want want you to kind of get an idea. Again, I hope as we go through books like this that many of you are reading through it as we go. And and I hope that uh, in addition to whatever we cover on Sunday mornings, what you're gaining is a a better understanding of what Paul was trying to communicate to this church. And so Paul in chapter 12, verse 1, he, he started out by saying, therefore, in view of God's mercies, Everything that came before chapter one, um, at chapter 12 about, about what God has done, how he's shown his mercies to us in Christ, how he has sent Jesus to be the, 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 the uh, sacrificial death of, on behalf of people who could never do this on their own. So God sent Jesus to be this one so that those who respond to this, this, this gift of God in Christ, that through faith, that Jesus then is the one who could cover their sins. And that those who then respond in faith, those are the ones that God declares right before him. Those are the ones who God gives his spirit to. Those those are the ones who God calls my, my children, my son, my daughter, and the Spirit prays and intercedes on behalf of these people. All of these things that Paul has laid out, Paul, um, uh, Paul says now in chapter 12, therefore in view of this, because of the mercies that God has given you, I urge you 
to present yourselves as a living and holy sacrifice. And then in verse two, he would say, he would say, don't be conformed to the pattern of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Everything that's followed in chapter 12 and 13 falls under that umbrella, not being conformed to the pattern of this age, but instead being transformed by a a new way of thinking, by the renewing of your mind. And so when Paul would go on in chapters 12, verses 3 and 8, he'd talk about spiritual gifts. This is how the church, the group of believers, relate to one another. And then in uh, chapter 12, verse 9, he would say, hey, let love be genuine. Let love be uh, authentic. Let there be no hypocrisy in love. And then he would say, abhor what's evil and cling to what is good. And he would describe what that can look like, not retaliating evil for evil, not seeking your own vengeance, trying to outdo one another in honor, right? Um, When your enemy persecutes you, instead of retaliating, you bless them instead. It's a countercultural way of thinking. But he says, all of this is what love being genuine looks like. It may seem like last week's sermon, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, uh, is detached because we typically view it as detached, where Paul talks about ruling powers, governing authorities, but it's not. It all falls under the umbrella of let love be without hypocrisy. How should believers uh, interact with the, the ruling powers around them and that they find themselves under? And then now today he wraps the section up. And so what should characterize the Christian is not lawlessness, but love. Because Paul is very mindful as he went around preaching the gospel that Jesus is death and his resurrection on behalf of sinful, guilty people, that if you believe in him, that your sins are forgiven and God brings you into this family. See, that would have been a countercultural message for a lot of the Jewish people. Wait, I thought I was supposed to obey the law. I thought my righteousness came from how well I obeyed the law. And so a lot of the accusation that Paul would be getting is you're preaching a lawless gospel. You're giving people an excuse to sin. You're making light of sin. And so Paul is, is, is in this letter, one of the things that Paul's trying to do is say, no, God's righteous character is, is not compromised in the gospel. God's righteous and holy character, it is upheld in the gospel. And there's no room for lawlessness. And so Paul's concerned that people might use the gospel to live lawless lives. So what should characterize a, a Christian is not lawlessness, but love. So let's take a look at verse eight. Chapter 13, verse eight. So Paul says, owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And so Paul had just finished saying in the few verses before, hey, pay taxes to whom taxes are due, pay pay honor to whom honor is due, pay respect to whom respect is due. He's telling believers in Christ, pay what you owe. And now to make a play on what you owe, Paul now says, owe nothing to anyone. It might sound like he's contradicting himself, but he's not. What he's doing is he's taking this idea of, hey, pay what's owed, pay what's owed, pay what's owed. By the way, don't owe anything to anyone except this. Now, before we go any further, you might see this and you go, oh, okay, that's the classic, we should not take debt. That's not really Paul's concern here. Um, You should consider whether or not you should take debt, but that's not really what Paul's going after here. It's wise to consider whether I should take on debt, but that's not... Paul's concern here. This this is not a place where Paul is saying, see, the believer should not take out a housing a a, a mortgage. Uh, The believer should not owe rent. The believer should not have a payment on a car. This, This is not what Paul's going after here, right? Paul's making a play on what he's just said, pay what's owed. By the way, owe nothing to anyone except this. And then he tells us what debt believers should owe and pay on. See, Paul's point in the previous two verses was, hey, make sure you make your payments on things. Ne- never, never lack on your payments. Never drag your feet on your payments. If you owe something, you pay it, right? And now here he says, owe nothing to anyone except this, love each other. Because to love somebody is a debt that can never ultimately be repaid. And that's Paul's point, is I don't want you to owe anything. The only thing I want you to owe, though, is I want you to owe love. Now, now, what Paul's not saying here is he's not getting at this idea that, well, I have this burden of a debt to love somebody because someone did something for me. Now I have to repay them in love and I feel this guilt until I repay them. That's not love. L- love is not, not an obligation that I have to fulfill and then when I fulfill it, I'm done. Paul's point is, if you're gonna owe anything, it's love that you need to owe and you can pay on that always. You will always be paying on that, 
love each other. That's what Paul wants people to do. Remember, um, chapter 12, verse nine was, let love be genuine. This is Paul's concern this whole time is, what does it look like to love? The believer in Christ, or the Christian, is characterized by not lawlessness, but love. And so he says, I want you to owe that. I want that to be your focus. I want that to be the thing that you are constantly paying on, is love each other. But then he explains to us why. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And he's talking about the Old Testament law, the the law of Moses, the commandments, best summarized in the Ten Commandments. See, Paul's concern is about lawlessness right now. He, He wants believers to know that lawlessness is not what characterizes a believer in Christ, but love is. And he helps us to see that love actually fulfills the law. He he says, because he's gonna help us, he's gonna explain this in a minute, but what he's getting at is when a person loves another person, you are doing what the law commands. They're not contradictory. They're not detached. Love and law are not detached in Paul's understanding. They go hand in hand. Look at verse nine. He's explaining to us how love in another has fulfilled the law. Verse nine, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul takes the second half of the Ten Commandments, the the, the commandments that are predominantly uh, concerned about how you interact with other people. You shall not commit adultery. So faithfulness in a marriage, no no going outside of the marriage. You shall not murder, self-explanatory. You shall not steal, self-explanatory. You shall not covet. That is desiring something that you don't have that someone else does. And then he says, in any other commandment, And what Paul's getting at is any other commandment that commands us to do something for another person or how we should interact with another person. He says, all these commandments, the the second half of the, the 10 commandments, and then any other commandment, he says it can be summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself, which he's quoting directly from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, which is part of the Old Testament, right? Part of the law. He's saying, hey, this is something else Moses said. Moses told us about the Ten Commandments, but Moses also told us you love your neighbor as yourself. He says, when you love someone else, it fulfills the law because all of these commandments are about loving one another. It's about how you treat and interact with someone else. And he says, and all of those can be summed up in this one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. A note here. Um, Paul is not saying, nor was Moses when he wrote this, that you first need to figure out how to love yourself and then you can love your neighbor. We don't have a problem with self-love. We don't have a problem with self-love. We love ourselves too much. That's the problem. And and even people who you might interpret their actions, their words, or their, their, their behaviors as that person does not love themselves, actually, if you dig into it, you'll find out that they love themselves excessively and that's, partly what's behind that. That's what sin does to us as it manifests in our lives. We don't have a self-love problem. Paul's not telling us we need to work on loving ourselves. Now, does that mean I can't ever do things that that minister to myself, that, hey, I'm a a mom of four, five kids, six kids, two kids, one kid, right? And, And sometimes they just wear me down. Should I not do things to care for myself? No, you should. You you should do things that provide you fuel and energy and get you reoriented towards the Lord. Self-love does not reorient us towards the Lord. Oftentimes what's pushed behind self-love or self-care is oftentimes more focused on me and never gets me thinking about the Lord, never gets me depending upon the Lord. So that's why I say we don't have a self-love problem. We love ourselves too much. And so our problem is it's excessive. And so what needs to happen is what Paul is saying here is he's simply just taking for granted, making an assumption that we instinctively love ourselves. We do what we need to do to survive. We do what we need to do to take care of ourselves. If I'm hungry, I feed myself. If I'm able, if I'm thirsty, I feed myself. If I'm able, if I'm sick, I do what's necessary to care for myself. That is instinctive in me. God put it there, right? I survive. And he's saying, just like it's natural and instinctive to you to love yourself, love your neighbor in the same way. That's his point. 
You should not be so consumed with yourself that you can't love your neighbor until you're okay. That's not Paul's point. Paul's point is, just like you would love yourself, I want you to love others that way. It's an outward-looking perspective, right? I feel like I need to clarify that only because our culture is so big on self-love, self-care, and I want to clarify those things. And I hope you hear me saying that does not mean you can't go get manicures and pedicures and massages and all that good stuff or time away with the, the girls or with the guys. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you have a perspective that I need to fill myself up so that I can better love others, fine. But be very aware of when you cross that line and it becomes more consumed with me and it never orients me towards the Lord. Because you will never be filled. You will never care for yourself enough to where you feel ready to do what God's calling you to do, to love others. And at some point, we have to just say, you know what, Lord, if you're calling me to do this, I'm trusting you to give me what I need. I don't have it right now, Lord. I don't feel it right now, Lord, which is why the fruit of the Spirit is such a beautiful thing because the fruit of the Spirit is about what I can't produce on my own, but what the Spirit produces in me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right? These are things I'm not supposed to manufacture on my own. These are things that, that, that no amount of self-care or self-love will fill up in me because they are Spirit-produced. And so I want us to be careful that in a culture that focuses on, hey, care for yourself, care for yourself, care for yourself, we don't have that problem. What we need more is, Lord, I need what you have for me. I'm lacking, but if you're calling me to do this, I need what you have for me. I need the discipline, I need the perseverance, I need the love, I need the patience, I need whatever it is from you. Paul's point is, hey, it just comes natural to you to love yourself, love your neighbor in the same way. Make it, make, make it so uh, uh, natural to you that you're just so oriented towards your neighbor's needs. It's just like loving yourself. And Paul then is saying, hey, the commandments are all summed up in this command to love your neighbor as yourself. And so when he commands them to love each other, he's saying that's not lawlessness. It fulfills the law. In fact, when Paul quotes from the Ten Commandments, I don't think Paul is necessarily saying to us, hey, I want you to go back and read all these commandments and I want you to try to obey every single one. I don't think that's what Paul's getting at here. But what Paul is also not doing is he's not detaching love from God's moral standards. He's saying, hey, this is God's commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't covet. Uh, and any others like that. He said, this is God's, this is God's standard. This is, this is what it looks like to love. How do I know what it looks like to love? another person. I have to go to God's standards. I can't love someone in the way that God calls me to love. I can't love someone in a way that's genuine or without hypocrisy if I detach that from God's law, his moral standards. If I try to love someone and my act or my, my pursuit of loving someone is opposed to God's law, opposed to God's moral standards, I'm not loving genuinely. I'm not loving without hypocrisy. Now, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, but what I'm hoping you're seeing here is that Paul says loving a person must be connected and rooted in God's moral standards. That's a big deal. It's a really big deal because things are being pushed as love today and it's being detached from God's moral standards. That's not love. It's not love that's genuine it's not love that was, is without hypocrisy. And so Paul is, is helping us to see love as the Christian is supposed to live it out fulfills the law. It doesn't abandon it. It doesn't detach itself from the law. He'll go on in verse 10. Verse 10, he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Just like all those laws that he just listed were about don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's about protecting other people from doing, having wrong done to them. And he says, if you're loving each other, then you're not gonna do wrong to another person. Therefore, that's why Paul's able to say love is not about being lawless, it's about fulfilling the law. You're doing what the law requires. A person who was under the old covenant and they were trying to live out the law in obedience to the law, what Paul would be saying to them is, hey, if you weren't doing that motivated by love for another person and instead you were doing that by, by being motivated by self-righteousness, how can I check these boxes? 
you're missing the heart of the law. The, the laws that are about interacting with other people are about how you love. That's how God has revealed how you love other people. It's how God loves us. And so Paul says, believers in Christ, Christians, should be characterized not by lawlessness, but by love, because it actually fulfills the law. So if I were to, oh, in the military, at least the Air Force, I don't know what other branches you guys say, but foot stomp this. I think that's kind of funny, but they do it all the time. I'm going to foot stomp this, right? That means they want you to pay attention to this. You cannot love genuinely if you detach it from God's moral standards. How do I know what it looks like to love? I need to know God. And I need to know his character. I need to know his standards. Because if I'm pursuing love in a way that is opposed to God's moral standards, that's not love. At least it's not love that's genuine. It's not love that comes from God. All right, so Christians uh, should be characterized not by lawlessness, but by love, not darkness, but light. Not darkness, but light. Verse 11, besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And so, uh, depending on your translation, besides this is the ESV, most other translations say something along the lines of, uh, and do this because, right? And so Paul's making the connection. It's not just about what he's saying in the few verses we just looked at, loving one another, but, but Paul's looking all the way back now over chapter 12, all the way up to this point. All these things that he's talked about, to include things like, I'm gonna love my, my enemy by blessing them instead of cursing them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave room for God's wrath and not seek my own vengeance. I, I'm gonna submit myself to the ruling powers. So all of that Paul has said up to this point, he's now looking back over it as he wraps up the section and he says, besides this, or, and do this all because you know the time. Believers in Christ, Christians are supposed to be people who are aware of the time. And that doesn't mean you turn around and look at the clock. Now I got plenty of time, right? But it means that you're understanding where we are in God's timeline. We are in the last days. We we are in this time that, that the Old Testament was looking forward to. We are in this current present age that Paul says, hey, don't be conformed to that. And there's a, another coming age. That, that we are supposed to be living in light of. Christians are supposed to be people who are aware of this kind of thing, who are, who are mindful of this because we live differently. In, in Philippians chapter three, Paul would say it this way, your citizenship is not here on earth, but is in heaven. You live as an immigrant, as an alien, as a stranger in this place because your citizenship belongs somewhere else. You live in accordance with your citizenship. He says you should know the time. Well, Paul, what do you mean? Well, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. He's calling believers to wake up, right? And, and by the way, only believers in Christ can, can heed this. Only believers in Christ can be awake from sleep. Only believers in Christ can be given the eyes to see what God is doing and, 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 and the time frame that we're in. Now, it's not some, some hidden mystical knowledge. It's just it requires the Spirit. It requires that, that we be made new. It requires that we be made alive and that we're, we're not people that are in Adam, but are in Christ. Back in chapter five of Romans, Paul says you're either one. There's no in between. You're either in Adam still or you're in Christ. It's the law of excluded middle. If, you're, if, you, if you know logic, it's, there's no in, in between. You're either this or that, not someone in between. So you're either in Adam, which is where everybody is, apart from Christ, or if you have been made alive because you have believed in the gospel, you are in Christ. You have changed your relationship. It goes from being connected to Adam to being connected in Christ. If you're connected in Adam, you're still asleep. If you're connected to Christ, Paul's saying, wake up. Wake up, know the, know the time. Know what's going on. He says, because our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And that's a, that's a true statement, isn't it? I believed in Christ. And when Paul says, my salvation is near, he's not talking about, well, I might finally get saved, or if I keep living this way, I might finally get saved. No, he's talking about the salvation aspect that's future. And so again, a quick recap, when you read in the scriptures about salvation, it depends on the context. It can be usually three different, three different ways. And if you're in the Old Testament, particularly the Psalms, it can be a fourth way. Psalms are often talking about physical deliverance from enemies. In the New Testament, salvation can be justification, the moment I get saved and I'm declared right before God, right? I, I place my trust in Christ. 
I can be being saved, right? That's my growing in Christ. We call that our sanctification. I'm, I'm more and more being shaped by the Spirit, more and more growing into the image of Christ. That's my, my being saved, right? Or I'm waiting for the salvation that lies ahead, or I'm waiting for the day of completion, and that's the day Christ comes back and my salvation is complete. Every person in this room, every person who's ever believed in Christ, when they believed in Christ, there was a moment where they, they were transferred from darkness to light, and they went from being in Adam to in Christ, but their salvation is not complete. It is secure, but it was not complete because they've still not been rid of sin. You and I sitting in this room, we're not free from sin yet. We still have sin impacting our bodies. And so there is a process of salvation that God is not yet done with. When Christ comes back, we're told that we will raise just like he raised. We will have bodies just like he has. And when I have that body like he has, then my body is no longer impacted and infected by sin. That's when God's redemption is complete and I take this new body that God gives me and reconnects with the soul that he's made alive and I go and I live in the new heavens and the new earth that God has redeemed. That's when salvation is complete. Every believer in Christ that is alive is in the middle right now. We are secure in our salvation. It's not going anywhere. It can't be taken from us. Nothing I can do can cause me to lose that. And God is continuously working on me and that, that, that's different speeds for every person. And then there's the kind he talks about here. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The day of Christ's return is closer to me now than when I believed, some 20-something years ago or whatever, right? And, and tomorrow, the, the day of Christ is gonna be closer to me then than when I first believed. And we're, we're constantly moving forward towards that day when Christ will return. And so Paul says, wake up. All right, so then he does this, verse 12, this analogy of day and night. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So Paul takes day and night and he says, believers in Christ, the night is far gone. This present age, it's passing away. It's gonna be gone. This is why he tells us don't be conformed to this present age. The night is this present age. The day is at hand, right? And so the day that the Lord is coming, sometimes the scriptures will call that the day of the Lord. For the believer in Christ, the day of the Lord is a glorious day. For the person who's not a believer in Christ, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. And so he says, cast off darkness, works of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Now what Paul is going to do is, you, you got to understand his culture a little bit. So we could gather, it could be midnight right now, and we would have lights on. And, and if you're in this room, you wouldn't necessarily know it's dark outside. And so you, some of you work night shifts. And so you, you're able to work night shifts because we have artificial lights and things that, that can sustain us throughout the night. But that is not Paul's culture. Paul's culture, when the sun went down, work stopped. When the sun came up, you better be up because that's when you start working, right? And, and so this was their culture. There was no artificial lights where they could work throughout the night like we do now. They, they didn't have that. And so Paul's going to describe a culture that was very much ruled by day and night. There were some things you would do during the day that were appropriate, and then there were some things that people did at night. And he's saying, cast off the things that people do at night and live as people of the day. And he's gonna get specific. So he says, let us walk properly, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. So Paul's got three pairs of things here. Remember, daytime, there's things that are appropriate to do during the day. He's taking this analogy of, hey, during the day, you do things that are appropriate. You work, you, you do business, you, you take care of the, the home, what, whatever it is you're doing during the day. But when the night comes, there's not much you do. You're supposed to stay in, you're supposed to sleep, get ready for the next day. Unless you do these kinds of things. These kinds of things, at least the first two pairs, are particularly characterized by what people would typically do at night at that time. Now, I understand today people can do this all day long and do. Paul's culture was this is nighttime activity. This is what people would do at night. And he's got different, three different pairs here. Orgies and drunkenness. Orgies are not what we typically think today. It's still bad, right? But, but what we typ typically think today of orgies, we think college frat parties. Um, we think... Um, this is the PG part. We think group sex, right? We, we think just all kinds of sexual, sensual things. That's coming. That's not this word. This is more about excessive feasting, excessive drinking of alcohol, 
and which is why he pairs it with drunkenness, which is, again, excessive drinking of alcohol that then leads to you being impaired by the alcohol, leads to you being under the influence of alcohol. Paul's not condemning alcohol. Paul's going after the excessiveness of it and the influence of the excessiveness of it. And he says, hey, that's the kind of things that believers should not be characterized because that's nighttime stuff. You're people of the day. And so he's telling believers in Christ, wake up. You, you need to know your salvation, the return of the Lord is closer now than it ever has before been. So why, why would you then get caught up in this kind of stuff? Excessiveness of eating and, and excessiveness of drinking alcohol that then leads to drunkenness, that then leads to all kinds of other things. In Ephesians 5, 8, Paul would say, hey, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And so this is, Darkness, as Paul would describe it. Remember in verse 12, he says, cast it off. Cast off the darkness and instead put on the armor of light. This is darkness. Orgies and drunkenness. If you are caught up in excessive drinking and drunkenness, you're in bondage to darkness. And Paul says, cast it off. Put on the armor of light. He'll go on and he'll say not in sexual immorality and sensuality. And so uh, there's a couple words Paul could use for sexual immorality. One of the words he typically would use is porneia. You can hear the root word, porneia, right? Which is a much broader word. That's not this word. This word, um, I've, I've heard this word more often. Um, I'm not even gonna be able to think of the show. Anyway, um, this word is coitus. Okay, and it's, and it's simply just the act of sex, the act of intercourse. But when he pairs it with sensuality, which is losing self-control, giving in to desires and um, all the, the types of pleasures that come with that, when he groups those together, what he's getting after is any kind of sexual activity, any kind of sexual behavior that loses self-control, that goes against how God intended and designed sex to be in the context and the covenant of a marriage. And so that can be any number of things. Today, it's even broader. It includes pornography. It, in, it includes sex outside of marriage. It includes all the things that go against what God intended and designed for sex. God's intent and design for sex was between a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. And so anything outside of that or anything that distorts that, corrupts that, is what Paul would be going after here. That is darkness. Darkness. And if that's what you are caught up in, then you are in bondage to darkness. Now, I know, before we go to this next one, I know, like, these two, you're going, but, you know, I love Jesus, but I drink a little, right? I mean, it's that kind of thing, right? That's not what Paul's getting after. He's getting after the drunkenness. He's getting after the excessiveness. He's getting after the self-medication, right? The, the things that we do to, to escape things, and instead of going to the Lord with them, we go to these things, Right? That can be the excessiveness here. That can be this here. And this here, the sexual stuff, can just simply be, I enjoy it. Because sin feels good. That's, that's what sin does. Sin says, just go ahead and do that. You deserve that. Sin says, just, just go ahead because that's, that's, what, that's what you deserve for today. It's been a hard day. Just, just, just go ahead. And it's just like one little thing and you, you tell yourself, yeah, but I'm never gonna do that again. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna make it a habit. But you know what you do when you do things like, and you just try it once. It's like, just dip that in the, just dip that toe in there and see how it tastes, see how it feels, right? And you're like, I didn't get struck down that time. Relationships didn't get damaged that time. Nobody else seems to know. I didn't get caught. This is behavior that lives in the dark. This is creeping around. This is hiding. This is covering up. This is what darkness is about. And I'm telling you, like one little thing, right? It may, may seem like, okay, I'm not gonna do that again. Just, it didn't hurt anybody. One thing is opening the door and it gives you permission to justify it again. And then the next time you're gonna justify it again. And you're gonna tell yourself, I can stop any time and I'm gonna justify it again. And before you know it, you are so far down in your spiral of darkness that you cannot see a way out. You don't know how you got there, and yet it was one time here, a little bit more here, a 
little bit more here. Now you know why I gave the disclaimer I gave up front. This is what Paul's saying. He's saying these kind of things are darkness. If you're caught up in these things, you're in bondage to darkness. Then he would give this next set, not in quarreling and jealousy, which doesn't seem to really go, but it does go with what Paul's going to get into in chapter 14. So quarreling, strife, conflict among one another, bite, uh, biting at one another, um, backstabbing one another, gossiping, and jealousy, right? I want what they have. I deserve what they have. Now, we may read this list and we go, those aren't so bad, I mean, when we talk about excessive drinking and eating and drunkenness, and then we talk about uh, loose and self-controlled sexual behavior, quarreling and jealousy, come on, Paul. But sin manifests in this way so often. And we excuse it so often because it's not these things. Because we are prone to say these things are socially not acceptable, which is why Paul says they're characterized by things you do at night. You don't do things that are inappropriate during the day because people would see you do it at night. But these kind of things were going, nobody can see that. Let me tell you something. These things right here, quarreling and particularly jealousy, these are the things that we hold on to. These are the things that we give permission to. These are the things that start to build roots in us and opens the door for demonic activity. Say what? Paul in Ephesians, he would say, he's talking about anger at this point, but he'd say, hey, be angry and don't sin. Don't give the devil a place, a foothold. So if I'm angry and that sin, that anger turns into sin, Paul says you can give the enemy, the devil, a place, a foothold, a place to operate from. If that's the case with anger, that can be the case with any sin. And jealousy turns into bitterness and bitterness is rooted in anger and hatred. Listen, you might be looking at this list going, I don't do drunkenness and orgies. I, I mean, I'm married and I'm, I, I'm faithful in my marriage. I don't even look at pornography. But do you quarrel? Do you gossip? Do you slander? Do you fight with people? Do you look for conflict with people? Are you jealous? And are you giving place to that? That's also being in bondage to darkness. And Paul says, wake up. This is not what should characterize believers in Christ. Not not darkness, but light. And so he would go on in verse 14, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, there's your hope. If you're a believer in Christ and you're going, man, I'm I'm living in this darkness. I can see it now. The the Lord's showing this to me. I, I wouldn't have acknowledged it before, but he's shown it to me now. Paul would say, now put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Well, how do I put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Hey, if you're a believer in Christ, it's not about salvation. It's about, I'm gonna renounce the things that are sin. I'm gonna renounce the things that are darkness. I'm gonna turn away from those things. Call sin, sin. And instead, I'm gonna pursue Christ. How do I put him on? Well, part of putting him on means I'm making no provision for the flesh. The flesh is who I, who I am in Adam. That flesh is who I am apart from the grace of God through Christ. That doesn't characterize a believer in Christ. But oftentimes as believers in Christ, we may choose to go back after that. And we gratify our desires. We gratify our pleasures. And Paul says, don't make a provision for the flesh. You don't want to gratify its desires. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So what should characterize the Christian is not lawlessness, but love and not darkness, but light. Now, if this message seems to you today like there is a whole lot of heaviness and this is why I don't pursue Christianity, this is why I'm not a Christian, or this is why I don't go to church because of this kind of thing, I want want you to hear this. This is where freedom is found. Because anything uh, that I'm in bondage to that God did not design me to be in bondage to, anything that I'm in bondage to that, that is controlling me, that has my affections, that has my time and my attention, even if it feels good, even if for the moment I feel secure, any of those kinds of things, if I'm in bondage to that now, I'm not free. And Christ came to set us free. And where the spirit of the Lord is, the spirit is given to those who are in Christ, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. God wants freedom for his people. 
And yet what sin does is it entraps us, and when we give in to it, it starts to blind us, and it calls light a dark and dark light, and we, we can't really tell where's up and where's down. And God wants better for you. He sent Christ so that you would know that kind of freedom and not know the, the hurt and the shame and the guilt and the pain that comes with being in bondage to some of these things. And so this is not, this is not me saying to you, hey, clean up your sin problem. This is speaking to me too, right? This is believers in Christ, we deal with sin. We will deal with sin until the day Christ returns. We are called to put off darkness and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to engage in the battle that comes with pursuing Christ and not settle for far less than what God intends. That's me too. And at any moment, one of these things could start to creep into our life. And, and do we take it captive? Do, do we take that moment and we say, this has no place in my life? Do I start to confess the things that, that, that God makes me aware of? The, the anger, the bitterness, the jealousy, uh, the, the little dabbling in sin here, little dabbling in sin there, and I've justified it. One justification forms a layer of a callus. The next time, another layer of a callus. Next time, another, until now my conscience is seared and I'm calling evil good. And I can't love genuinely. 